this is going to be a conversation about why the people you love are going to lie to you and why that's okay. So buckle up. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, now, I am a very special type of immigrant, I guess you could call it, because I'm an in-betweener. So I now live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is where Drake lives. Um, and I've been in North America between Canada and the United States um, since I was three years old. So I moved from Lagos, Nigeria at three years old. So I've never really been able to identify as a true Nigerian simply because if I were to ever go to Nigeria, which I've never been back since I was a little kid, um, if I were to ever go back to Nigeria, they would immediately identify me as what most of them would consider a foreigner, despite what my birth certificate says, simply because I don't talk like them. I don't have an accent like them. I don't dress like them. I'm clearly, um, no matter how much I might try and pretend and convince, um, not uh, authentic to their culture as they would see it. At the same time, as a quote unquote Canadian or an American, they wouldn't consider me an authentic American or Canadian either, simply because I wasn't born here. Um, and that's unfortunate because you kind of find yourself in between uh, both places in life growing up as a child. And there's a level of unfamiliar unfamiliarity that you always have everywhere you go. When you're at home with your parents, um, it's clear that the way you grew up is very different from the way they grew up. You know, you always hear things from your parents about when I was a kid, I had to walk 10 miles to school with 85 books on my head and no water. And I had to walk my 85 brothers and sisters to school along with me. And if none of them didn't get to school on time, I would get whipped with a belt at home, uh, not a belt, a cane at home. And we had to chase around goats in Turkey. You know what I mean? And when you go to school, you have all the kids looking at you like, Oh, what is that you're wearing? Are you what's that on your head? Or what, why are you dressed like that? Or um, why do you have Vaseline on your face? Like, why are you so oily? You know, it's just you never seem to really fit in. You understand either either place you are, whether you're at home or whether you're at school. And I'm not saying that to complain. I'm just saying that to help you get a better understanding of how I grew up. And in the process of growing up, I always used to be a curious child. Um, I was what you would call the trouble child. Um, trouble in the sense where I'm always getting into trouble. I'm always climbing trees, doing something to hurt myself, and always involving others in my activities. I think from very on, early on, I had this um, innate leadership quality where I was able to gather a group of people and convince them to, to, to try something or to do something or to participate um, in an activity. Um, so as a child, I was very social and not just social, very good at um, gathering people, understanding people and convincing them of something to follow me in a specific direction. So I guess you could say that was just a quality I was born with. And ironically enough, uh, both of my parents are both firstborn children in their own family. Um, so my middle name is Omoro Dion, spelled O-M-O-R-O-O-M-O-R-O-D-I-O-N, I believe. I never spell it, so I might even have spelled my own middle name wrong, which is ridiculously crazy. I never spell it. I never write it out. I never type it out. But that's my middle name. And the pronunciation of Amor Dion is firstborn of firstborns. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a perfect title for me. But I think it also speaks to how the way my parents named me was, in a sense, a manifestation of who I became. Um, and there is a level of spirituality to it. And we're going to get into some spiritual stuff. Don't worry. It gets really deep. Um, and I think that also manifested itself in many different ways in my life. Um, as I, I mentioned before, being a leader of children at, uh, when I was younger and then eventually growing to be 
um, just a very independent thinker. You understand what I mean? And never just uh, going about life uh, without thinking of the how and why. I was always a how and why child. Whenever someone would say, this is how we do things. This is how we operate. This is how we live our life. This is how we get things done. I was always the child and then the teenager and um, then eventually the adult that is constantly asking how and why. It, I find it very hard to um, just accept that this is how things have always been done. This is how things will continue to be done and everyone should just fall in line and shut up and not ask questions, right? I don't mind following instructions, but I'm always someone, I've always been someone that wants to know why are we doing it this way? Why don't we do it a different way, right? Who chose this? Who decided on this? Who's leading this? Who's operating this? I always want to know the behind the scenes, how it gets done, the intricate details. That's been my personality. And the reason I give you that backstory of my personality as a child and who I've always been since birth is it will come into play in a lot of what I discuss about my relationships and not just my relationships with romantic partners, but my relationships with um, my family as well. And um, it's very interesting because when you're growing up, um, even as you grow past a child and you begin to understand things a little bit better, you see things. And it's, it's so crazy being, a, being an adult and then looking back on your life as a child you are provided with so much more context and understanding of the things that you're seeing because you're an adult that you weren't able to quite grasp or understand when you were a child. And you're, as the memories hit you, you're able to see things in a completely different light. And even sometimes things that you never imagined were wrong or bad um, or, you know, thought, I, thought of at all. You look back on them as an adult and you're like, whoa, that was messed up what I went through or whoa, that was crazy what I went through or whoa, that was crazy what I experienced or I saw or I did, right, as a child. Because as a child, you know, you have your innocence and you don't quite really understand how the world really works. And that's the most interesting part about this conversation um, is, and the story, is that the process of understanding how the world really works and who people really are is a beautiful thing. It's scary and it's upsetting and um, it's depressing at some points, but eventually it becomes beautiful when you really understand it. And um, I say that to say, as a young child in the process of always wanting to know more, um, I would see things I would see specifically when I was younger, my parents doing things and saying things and acting a specific way, but I didn't quite understand it yet. And I remember being young and growing up maybe like 10 or 12 years old and constantly hearing my parents speaking in the language we call Yoruba. Essentially, Yoruba is the language of uh, Nigeria, right? There's In Nigeria, there's different tribes, right? And of those different tribes in Nigeria, each tribe speaks uh, a slightly different language, right? And so I am of the um, Yoruba tribe, and so we speak the language Yoruba, right? And um, so my parents, ironically enough, didn't teach me Yoruba. Uh, they opted out of letting me in on how to understand it and really speak it. Um, I, I still to this day, I don't really understand why I think from their own perspective, now looking at as at it as an adult, I think what was really at play was they spent their entire lives, meaning their twenties and thirties, um, their entire lives up until that point, um, growing up in Nigeria and living in Nigeria. And so the process of moving away from Nigeria, I, I'm the first born, of course. So we moved away from Nigeria to New York, uh, when I was around three years old. And, you know, the process of moving away from a third world country like Nigeria to America, you know, the land of opportunities and dreams and the American dream. I think as an adult, they really wanted to get rid of everything that reminded them of the place that they were um, in Nigeria and everything that consisted of where they had come from. 
not to say they wanted to whitewash their background, but, you know, when you take that step forward, uh, a lot of times, you know, na it's natural as human beings. You, you kind of want to forget the trauma or the things that you went through in the place that you were in in the past and focus on this new, bright and amazing future with the family that you're building, especially me being the first child. Right. It's it's kind of like a fresh start to things. And so I understand looking back on it as an adult, why they kind of just said, you know what, we're here in America. Our children are going to learn English. They're going to go to good American schools. Um, it, their life is just going to be drastically different than ours. And I think Yoruba for them probably represented something of the past. Um, so it did. they didn't see a purpose in teaching me that. I, I'm just assuming that was what was going on subconsciously. And so I never got the chance to really learn or understand Yoruba. I would understand it broken, like broken. You know how you can just kind of put together a sentence and understand the gist of what someone's saying when they're speaking to you? That was about it. Other than that, I couldn't really understand anything that they were saying to me. Um, and so it was interesting because I would be in the car sometimes and I would hear them speaking in Yoruba. And this was the interesting trick they played because now that they were able to speak Yoruba, I couldn't understand them. So theoretically, they could talk about anything. And still to this day, um, I'm sure they've had plenty, they had had plenty of conversations in front of me that were either inappropriate for me to hear or just, you know, flat out, you know, not something a child should be knowing or understanding or hearing from their parents. And they had that conversation in front of me in Yoruba so that I couldn't understand them. And to this day, I still won't know what was said. Um, and so, but I think even as a child in reading into context clues, sometimes you can feel what's being said as opposed to hearing it um, and understanding it even. Um, and it's just a feeling in your soul. And I do think that many times my parents had disagreements um, in front of me but I just couldn't understand what they were saying. And I do wish I could go back and understand exactly what was said and how they were speaking to each other because it would provide me with so much more context. I think as a child, I had so little understanding of relationships and partnerships and how they work. I had so little understanding of what it really means to build a life with someone and pick a stranger because <laughs> that's essentially what you're doing you're picking a stranger i had no idea what it really meant to pick a stranger get to know them enough that you feel comfortable spending the rest of your life with them and then create life with them it just as a child you don't get it you just you've only known your parents since you've been born and that's all you know and you don't really quite understand who they are or what they represent outside of just being your parents. And it creates this very godlike figure about your parents because you've spent all your life knowing them, right? And they've spent all your life knowing you, but you haven't known everything that they've been through in their life, right? You've known them the entire time you've been alive, but there's more to their life than just since you've known them. And as a child, it's a very hard concept to grasp that your parents are whole, real, flawed human beings outside of just you. And you. Because as a child, you think the world revolves all around you and everything is centered around you. And I think the process of me escaping that innocence of thinking that, like, you, you know, my parents are godlike figures that don't make mistakes was a very pivotal point in my life because when I was younger as, you know, let's say 12, 13 ish, 14 ish, you know, my dad was a pastor, right? We've moved, we've lived in three distinct places. We've lived in New York in my early, early years, you know, like before grade one. And then we've lived in Indiana, which is like grade four for me to grade, uh, sorry, we've lived in New York while I was young, before grade one, then grade one to like three, I lived in um, a city just outside of Toronto and, uh, called Hamilton, Ontario. And then grades four to eight, 
I lived in a city just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, called Pendleton, Indiana. And so, and then after grades, uh, so high school, so after grade eight, high school to um, uh, like college and stuff, high school to the graduation, I should say, um, I spent back in Hamilton, Ontario. So there was a process of, you know, moving around all these different places. And that's where I also think that curiosity came from. And so in the process of growing up and moving to all these uh, different places and being a curious child, I, I struggled to unsee my parents as the godlike figures mainly because of a couple reasons. First, when I was 12, 13 years old, my dad was a pastor, right? He was a pastor for a little bit, and then he was also very heavily involved in the church. He always had this um, quality about him where he was a very good teacher, very good leader of men as, as well, a, a very good like motivational speaker, and, and, and people would come to him for advice and stuff like that. Um, but he was like a reluctant pastor. When I say reluctant, I just mean like, he just kind of, he didn't want to do all of the stuff that, that came with having to be a pastor, you know, managing the church and doing all that other stuff and things like that, especially when we had come to Hamilton, Ontario for the, for the second time. No, 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 for the first time, sorry. So um, my grades, uh, like one to three years, uh, he was very reluctant to become a pastor because, you know, there was just a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility that I just feel like, you know, at the time he just didn't want, he just didn't feel like having on him at the time. And, but he did pastor for a little bit at the local church. And, you know, that is so, it's, a, it's such an interesting um, way to see your dad, because on top of the fact, when you're young, you already grow up, you know, idolizing your dad, even more so to watch him, you know, be in front and speaking to um, the other adults of the church is like almost like, oh my gosh, like my parents can't make mistakes. My, my, my dad is perfect. You know, my mom is perfect. And, and you don't really have a grasp. You, you begin to build this really skewed way of thinking about your parents where they're just like these figures that are, uh, you know, so perfect and so amazing that they don't mis make mistakes or have any issues or problems or traumas or anything, right? Like, and I feel like that ended up hurting me. It ended up hurting me because in the process of growing up, my parents, uh, you remember when I talked about those arguments or those situations or those conversations they were having in Yoruba? It turns out that they had a lot more issues um, in their relationship and with each other than I ever was able to understand as a child. Now, all relationships and couples go through things, so there's not anything particularly wrong or crazy or um, unbelievable about that. But what I will say is I think because of the church background, because my dad was working as a, as a pastor part time because, um, you know, I couldn't really even understand my parents when they were disagreeing or arguing. I think it led me to believe that um, they were like saints. And as a child, it's good. But as you grow up and you understand more and you see more, it becomes devastating. And after my grade, 11th grade year, I started really understanding things better that were going on in my parents' relationship and seeing them disagree. And there was one particular disagreement that they had that set the relationship um, on fire. I'll just say it like that. When I say set the relationship on fire for my dad, it became um, a situation where he felt so uh, disrespected, right? And that's his own perspective. He felt so disrespected that he was not going to, he was done with the relationship. 
He was done with the marriage. Um, he was done with everything that went on. Now, I'll just say this for for reference, okay, just in case any of your minds go to a particular place. My mom didn't cheat on him. It wasn't that. Um, my mother made a decision um, financially um, and a purchase financially that he did not agree with to the point where he felt disrespected. And rightfully so, he has the right to feel disrespected. Um, so he left, right? And when I say he left, I mean, you know, he, at the time, he was working, um, at the time, we were living in Hamilton, Ontario, because remember, this is high school. So at the time we were living in Hamilton, Ontario, I was just, you know, getting ready to graduate high school. And he was working in the States. I believe at that time he was working in Wisconsin. He, he, he has multiple different jobs. He's an engineer, okay? So I think at the time he was working in Wisconsin. And so I guess his plan was just, you know, I'm working in, I'm working in the States right now. I don't have any particular, I'm upset with the relationship and I don't have anything else to say or do in this relationship. So I'm just going to reside in the States where I've been. And I have no reason to come back and, you know, check in on what's going on there. Not that I, I can't speak for him and say that he didn't want to see his children. You know, I have a little brother as well. But um, I just don't think that at that point he was ready to see my mother and have a conversation with my mother, which is perfectly fine. They're adults. But I do think at that time, that really was the period where because of the absence of my father, I was forced to ask a lot of questions and I was forced to be a lot more curious and I was forced to try to gain a, a much better understanding of what was going on and why these things were happening. Because obviously when you're a child and you're used to growing up with both of your parents there and seeing them every day, and now you go into a situation where not only is my dad not there every day, but also you're seeing the emotions on your mom. I remember I would come back from school um, some days and my mom would be laying on the couch just in the dark crying. Um, I remember how depressed she was for a long period of time. Um, I remember how hard her life was financially, emotionally, physically, mentally, every spiritually, all of that um, for quite some years after my dad left, because um, at least from what I understand, he kind of just up and left. And for at least the, a span of six to eight months, he had no contact with my mother, mind you, they're not, they're not in a, they're not dating. They're not in a talking stage, right? They're married with children and been married for years. So to have no contact for months with the person you're still married to is uh, tough on the person you're still married to. So for many reasons, and on top of having to manage us and um, deal with us still and keep us happy and keep us well and fed, um, I understand it was very tough on my mom. And that's not to say, you know, I don't understand what my dad went through. But <clears throat> at that time, it was an eye opener because my parents were finally forced to sit down and talk to me about issues they were having with themselves and issues they were having in their relationship and issues they were having with each other. And it was actually it was a shell shock. I'll be honest with you. It was a shell shock. Because up until that point, I had never had any serious relationship and I had never been w w with a partner in a serious capacity where I ever got the chance to understand how people really are and how people are flawed and how dealing with people is not always um, rainbows and sunshines. Um, and relationships are a lot more than just uh, the surface happiness that you see on TV or you see in movies. Um, there's so much more to it. And I remember my, I remember being so angry with my dad because remember how I said, you know, he was a pastor and, you know, I would have so much reverence for him and um, look up to him so much because of what he did and how not just I looked up to him, but how other people looked up to him. And on top of that, being the firstborn child, so you already feel the firstborn child and being a son. So you automatically feel that pressure of, you know, living up to your dad and you automatically feel like you're the young lion that's meant to go out and conquer the world. It was a very, 
a devastating and frustrating feeling to really realize that my dad was human. And it sounds strange, I know, because you're probably like, well, I've, all, all dads are human, and whoa, well, your life well, your life sucks because you realize your dad is human. But I, I just say that to say, you know, as a child, you don't know, right? As a child, you don't understand. As a child, you don't, you don't get it, right? You just see your dad as your dad, the amazing man. Uh, you don't really see him for his problems or his fears or his insecurities or his issues or his traumas. Um, you just see him as this perfect person, and even more so because he was working as a pastor and so involved in the church. And so um, that was a that was a really frustrating time in my life. And I and I just remember being in like 11th and 12th grade. And I remember waking up every day with so much anger inside me. So I, I just remember it weighing me down like a ton of bricks. I remember, you know, what it felt like to come home from school and see my my mom crying and just the feeling that you get is really indescribable because you know why your mom's crying, you know the situation, you understand it better and there's still really nothing you can do about it. And then on top of that also knowing that as, you know, his child it's like, well, why doesn't he care enough to come and see me? Why doesn't he care enough to speak to me? Why is he avoiding his family? Why is he this? Why is he that? And not really understanding and then kind of blaming yourself. I just remember having so much anger inside me. I just, I just, I couldn't breathe. And I remember how difficult it would be to have a conversation with him. I would have so many questions and I would just get so upset. I couldn't even. I wasn't, I wasn't able to develop right. I, I remember I was, I had so much anger, I would take it and I would, and I was like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't bear the amount of anger I was carrying around with me anymore. So at the time I was playing football and obviously in the process of playing football, you're going to work out. And so I remember working out every day. I would be in the gym. I would even come to the gym earlier before high, like I was in high school. So before school opened, I would come earlier so I could work out beforehand. And I remember, you know, every time I wanted to get that good set out, that last couple reps, I would channel that anger that I had towards my dad to get the last couple of reps up or to get the last set in. And looking back on it, I dealt with it how I felt that I, needed to deal with it at the time but looking back on it it was so unsustainable to to walk around with that much anger um in me uh, on a daily basis i i i really literally uh, had to channel it into something luckily i had football at my disposal to channel that anger into something because i can only imagine what i would have channeled it into if it wasn't for already having something at my disposal that I could put that energy into because that anger, make no mistake about it. I told you we would get a little spiritual here. That anger is energy. And so at the time, you know, when you're younger, you don't really understand that. And you also don't really understand how to channel that energy, um, especially all of that negative energy. And I remember being so angry that one day, um, you know, I, my, my dad called and he was trying to speak to, I forget if he was trying to speak to me or my mom or something like that. And I think he was speaking to my mom first and I could just see that she was upset about something or they were arguing about something. And I remember my brother being in the room and my mom being there as well. And I think she was trying to hand the phone to us or whatever. And, um, I just kind of took the phone from her and I said to him, we don't effing care about you anymore. Um, you should just leave us the F alone um, and get the F off of uh, out of our life along those words. And I hung up the phone. And you have to understand, I know for the average um, white person uh, or non-immigrant, 
it might that might seem like, well, you just told your dad to f off, no big deal. So maybe a couple of weeks grounding, no big deal, nothing, nothing crazy. But for an immigrant, um, I'm sure, um, especially a Nigerian, I'm sure you can imagine how insane that is to take the phone and tell your dad to f off and get the f out of your life and uh, you know all that stuff, um, cursing him out and stuff like that, and. I remember at the time I did it, I felt empowered. But I also remember being so taken control of by the anger that I had that I could actually physically feel myself spiraling out of control. And it was at that point I started to realize that, you know, if I don't let go of my anger, I'm never going to be able to, to live my life. Um, and I think for, after that time, me and my father didn't speak for probably eight months or so. It was quite a while. We didn't speak. We didn't speak on the phone. We didn't text. We didn't contact each other at all. And I think, um, eventually I apologized, not even because I wanted to apologize, but I think because my mom had recommended me and apologize and we had talked about it a couple of times. Because she wasn't in the, she wasn't, at the end of the day, whether we, she was not with my dad or whether she was with my dad, um, she's still a Nigerian mom and she did not appreciate me disrespecting my father, understandably. So we had a conversation about that and I apologized and things like that. Um, but I still think that I was still carrying so much anger. I wasn't really apologizing because I wanted to apologize or I felt bad. I was more apologizing because my my mom was upset with me and because she was upset with me i wanted to make her happy by apologizing um but i think what ended up happening after a while is i eventually i remember th this is something so interesting that my dad said at the time um we were sitting in a mandarin I don't know if you've ever been to a Mandarin restaurant. It's like a buffet, just a Chinese restaurant. It's like a buffet. And we're sitting in the Mandarin. And he was like, you know, there's some things I can tell you that, you that I know you'll have questions of. But there's some things that even if I told you, you wouldn't understand until you're in your own relationship and you become, you know, a full-blown adult and you have your own relationships. So it would be pointless for me to tell you because you wouldn't even get it. And at the time, you know, I'm like in 11th grade. So I'm like, whatever, dad, you just you're probably just, you know, spewing a bunch of stuff just to just to make yourself seem better. And then I actually got into my own relationships, my own serious long term relationships. And <laughs> I remember having. I remember having a fight with my first girlfriend that I started dating uh, when I was in JUCO, junior college. Um, so when I was like around 19. And I remember thinking to myself, our relationship is nothing like I imagined a relationship to be. There's so much more deception and lying and manipulation. And I don't even mean that in a sense of like lying and manipulation, like, oh, uh, you know, you're lying to me because you're cheating on me or you're lying to me because you're sleeping with another man. Like I, I even mean like the white lies and the way someone will manipulate your emotions to get what they want from you. And I remember going through that and having arguments and going back and forth with my first girlfriend and just kind of being like, you know what? I kind of get it now. I get what I have a little bit of a more of an understanding of what it's like to go through a relationship. But I also understand more about how people work. And what I mean by that is part of what helped me let go of the anger was the realization that as I was in these relationships, right, these serious relationships as an adult, right, growing up and experiencing, you know, 
not just one relationship and I experience another and then another, um, having the understanding that like even the people you love are going to lie to you. And there is, um, there's like a thought that you grow up with as you watch TV shows and movies where you feel like true love is this magical thing where you see someone, you meet someone, you realize how amazing they are, you fall in love and you live happily ever after. And the implied part about the happily ever after is that you never have any issues and everyone treats the other person how they're supposed to be treated. The reality of that is, is that's never how it actually is. Um, people don't treat you all the time how you deserve to be treated. People lie to you. They deceive, they deceive you. They manipulate you. They do things to you. Um, they do things behind your back. They say things behind your back. They serve their own interests. And that was my biggest realization as I got into my own serious relationships. I began to realize that everyone, including my family members, including my loved ones, including the people I'm romantic with, are there to serve their own interest. Now, when I first say that, you might think, wow, that's such a dark way to think about life. That's such a, that's such a horrible way to think about life. But in reality, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was, it was discovering that everyone around me is there to serve their own interests actually gave me the perspective I needed to forgive my dad. And I'll say, I'll say it like this, because that realization, right, really gave me a holistic understanding of my fit into the world. I stopped seeing myself as this main character where the world revolves around me. And I stopped being so offended when someone would lie to me or misuse my trust or mistreat my trust, right? Because I remember being in my second serious relationship. And she did something at the time. And I asked her about it. And she lied about it. And even at the time when she lied about it, I remember asking her about, you know, did this happen? Did that happen? And even her answer didn't make me feel um, like I could trust it. It didn't make me feel like she was telling me the truth because there was a lot of gaps in her story and the way she was explaining things. On top of that, other people were telling me other things. So I remember during that time when I wasn't able to get clear answers from her, and this is the girl I was dating, I remember going on a wild goose chase. Like a crazy goose chase, trying to be Sherlock Holmes, solving this clue, solving that clue, asking this person about the situation as they experienced it with her, asking this person about the situation from a different perspective as they experienced it with her, asking this person who wasn't involved in the situation, but know something about someone who was involved in the situation and what they heard from that person, asking someone else who came across her at exactly 3.33 p.m., as the situation was about to happen just before it was about to happen to see what they say about this and what that person says about this and this and that and this and that and this and that. And I was just obsessed, obsessed with trying to figure out the truth, right? Because I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't fathom the idea, especially in my second relationship. The second relationship was the one that really helped me realize I couldn't fathom the idea that the person I loved so much and the person I trusted so much and the person I cared for so much and at the time the person I spent the most time with would actually lie to me, purposely deceive me and keep things from me. Not just one thing, but multiple things. And I remember that feeling burning inside me so much that I couldn't think about anything else but trying to find the truth. Because I wanted to believe that she wouldn't lie to me or deceive me and she would tell me the truth, but I had to confirm it. I also had to know if she was lying to me, I had to know why she was lying. 
right? It wasn't enough for me to just accept, you know what, you're lying and this isn't right for me and I should leave this relationship. I had to stay in the relationship and figure out all the context clues I possibly could to understand why she was lying to me about this situation, right? And that was <laughs> a sobering experience because it did two things. I'm talking about my second relationship, my second serious relationship, my second girlfriend. It did two things. It taught me a lot about what it's like to be a man in a relationship with a woman. Not that all women lie or anything like that, but just, you know, having a better understanding of the relationship dynamics. It also taught me that there is a certain level of responsibility you have to yourself to only try and control what you can control. Because the reality of it is the amount of time and effort that you spend chasing people around to figure out the truth is pointless. Because people are going to lie to you if they feel like lying to you. They're going to deceive you if they feel like deceiving you. Now, does that make it right? Not necessarily. But the reality of it is people are going to serve their own best interests. And the reason I say that that was such a revolutionary um, thing that I discovered is that you almost switch the way that you see people when you realize they're lying to you or deceiving you. Because you realize it's not really about you. It's not. And that's the craziest part. You Like when I was growing up and I, you know, my dad left and all this stuff. I used to think that he lied because of me. I used to think that his lying or, you know, um, the way that he responded to the situation or whatever was a reflection of me, right? I used to think that, you know, my girlfriend and, uh, you know, my friends as well lying to me about situations that had happened or, you know, people just around me lying to me about things um, or deceiving me about things. I used to think that, that was some sort of um, um, systematic plan to destroy me and take me down. You know, it's that main character syndrome of feeling like I'm on a TV show where, you know, all the supervillains are, are plotting against me to take me down and destroy me. And it's like, no, no, that's, that's really not what's happening. What's actually happening is that those people have their own self-interest at heart. And when you stop aligning, with someone's best interest, right? Because at the end of the day, each individual is there to serve themselves. Because in reality, if you're not serving yourself, then you're kind of wasting your life away and you're wasting your time because nobody's going to serve you like you will serve you. And if you don't do the job of trying to serve your own best interest, then nobody will. And so sometimes in the process of serving your own best interest, you're going to have to lie to people. You're going to have to deceive people. You're going to have to um, uh, put yourself before someone else. You're going to have to use someone as a stepping stone to get to where you need to go. You might have to lie to someone in order to, to get what you want, whether it be to keep the relationship or to, to, to keep the person or to not hurt them. And I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm just saying I understand, I, un I started to understand a lot better why people are doing it. And I, st and I stopped being so offended by it. And I stopped asking myself why, because I knew why. It serves them, right? And that's what they're here on this earth to do, to serve themselves, serve their own best interests. And I stopped, I really, all that mumbo jumbo that people talk about, you know, I put others first before myself. I do this first before anyone else. I do this. Uh, if I pushed you off of a bridge, are you going to try to save the person next to you first? Or are you going to try to save yourself first? Right? I know it's an extreme example, but it's reality. Right? In the end, as generous as each person wants to believe they are, as amazing and kind and nice and, 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 and 
great, um, sweethearted, everyone wants to believe that they are. In the end, when it comes down to saving me or you, you will naturally be more inclined to save yourself before you save me. Laws of human nature, okay? And I say that to say that understanding helped me understand why people will lie to me, even the people that I love the most. Why people will deceive me, even the people that I love the most. Why people will hurt me, even the people that I love the most. And like I said, it becomes a good feeling after a while. You start to realize that there's nothing wrong with the fact that they're serving their own self-interest. And I started to realize, even outside of just my family or my girlfriend at the time, or my girlfriends that I've had, even in my friendships, I started to realize even my best friend or my close friends are going to lie to me and are going to deceive me and are going to do things that serve their own interests before mine. Now, they will be my friend, right? And they will care about me, right? And want the best for me as long as it also aligns with their own best interests, right? And a lot of times, the moment things stop serving their own best interest or God forbid they might go in the opposite direction where my best interest is the opposite of their is their worst interest for some reason, I guarantee you they will no longer be as invested in you, right? They will no longer feel the need to treat you any particular way. And that's okay. Because at the end of the day, it was never about me, right? All of my friendships, right, are not really about me in a sense. My friendships are about how I can serve them. And it's the same thing vice versa. I don't even mean a business relationship. I don't even mean, um, you know, a friends with benefits or anything like that. I literally mean even my platonic friendships are really, when you dig down to them at their core, are about how I can serve them, the value that I bring to them. It's not really about how amazing of a person I am. Because you don't go out and be friends with the homeless man on the street because of how amazing they are to you or how amazing of a person they are, right? You make friends with people and you invest yourself in people who are serving you one way or another, whether you realize it or not. Even in someone who might be broke and not financially stable could be serving you in a way that you don't realize. You could have someone, you could hang out with the homeless man in the street, but because you feel that genuine company and connection and someone that will spend time with you and quality time with you, you're getting something from that. It's not about that person. It's really about you. And so I say that to say we are all selfish in our own way. We are all selfish about life and about ourselves. And that's okay. That selfishness will lead people to lie to you. That selfishness will lead people to manipulate you sometimes, will lead people to hurt you sometimes. But that's okay. That's actually a good thing, right? And it's a good thing because as you realize that people are most self-interested in themselves, you realize that life is really all just about perspective. And each of us are walking around in this super beautiful way, feeling like this entire painting, this world, these people around us are all focused on us as an individual. And the, we all walk around feeling like we're the most important person because we've spent the most time with ourselves. And what I find so beautiful about it what I find so beautiful about the self-interest is that it's a function of your perspective. And in a very magical way, we're never able to gain more perspective than just our own. And so in the weirdest way, we're stuck in this constant cycle of 
only ever seeing things one way, no matter how hard we try, only ever being, inve- being truly invested in one person, no matter how much we try. And even the love we do give is unconditionally conditional because at the end of the day, we're all an individual. That's not to say you won't care about things as much or even more than yourself. You know, like if you give birth to a child, that's not to say you wouldn't run into a burning building to save that child. But at the end of the day, even your own child, you'll never truly know what it's like to be them. You'll never truly have enough perspective to know everything that they've been through and vice versa. Even though you gave that child life, you'll never truly, truly be as invested in that child as you are in yourself simply because you don't, you're not that child. Do you understand what I'm saying? And there's a really weird aspect to perspective that I find super interesting in the mind and the soul as one individual. Because no matter the love, no matter the connection, no matter the individual, no matter the romance, I'm still going to love me and care about me and think about me just as much, if not more, than I think about anyone else. And even when I have a child, I still spent, you know, um, the first 20 years of my life thinking about me, worrying about me. And so in the span of my life, right, if you think about um, your child growing up and becoming an adult, right, and then going off and then living their own life where you don't have to think about them or worry about them on a daily basis anymore, like when they're an infant, you only spend a minority of your life even caring about someone on a close enough level like you would a child for it to rival your own self-interest. But majority of your life, even when you have children that you love so much and care for so much, you spend it invested in yourself. And there is no amount of birth or life-giving or romantic relationships or intimate moments that can ever truly make your life have more self, more interest in someone else more than yourself. And so the people you love are going to lie to you, not because they dislike you, not because they don't want to be your friend, not because you're a bad person, but simply because they're here to serve their own self best interest. And that's okay. Because at the end of the day, even you as an individual are here to serve your own best interest. And you're here to take care of you first. Because if you don't take care of you first, there's no way you can help anyone else out in this world. And while lying might not be morally correct, lying is a function of self-interest. So the idea that we're ever going to be able to remove the aspect of lying to people that we love from human nature is quite impossible because it's part of what makes us human. The idea that we can only ever see life from our own perspective inherently means that we will always have our own self-interest in mind. And because we always have our own self-interest in mind, we're going to lie to people. We're going to deceive people. We're going to manipulate people, even in ways that we're not aware of ourselves, simply because we, it's built inside of us to care about ourselves more than we could possibly care about anyone else ever. And that's beautiful. 